Marcel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jake. Great uh, to be here. We've been doing, wanting to do this for a while. I'm glad we were able to get a chance to do it in person here in Florida. Um, let's start with some fun. We're taping this more towards the end of February, and Super Bowl week was about you know a month ago or so, yeah. and you appeared on Food Network with Guy <laughs> Fieri as you judged four chefs on their cooking ability, yeah, which I yeah. thought was fun. Tell us how that came about, what that experience was like for you. Uh, you know, I've been a longtime foodie. Um, yeah. I love, you know, being in front of the camera sometimes and, and having fun that way. Yeah. Um, you know, Food Network asked me to come on. Well, I'll take a few steps back. Yeah. The previous year, they asked me to compete. Uh, okay. So we competed. And what does that mean, competed? Uh, well, the same show you saw me judging, yeah. I was a competitor on that same exact show oh, okay. on a different episode. Trying to and, cook. Well, succeeding in cooking. Successfully cooking, not trying to cook. There you go. And, uh, you know, <laughs> my teammate and I, we won. You won. Good. Who was your teammate? Uh, chef Brian Malarkey, based okay. out of San Diego. Great okay. chef. Awesome guy. Great. Uh, now a good friend of mine. Very cool. And we won, so we are the, the standing champions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. So... This year they had us. They they had me come out and judge, and it was a new experience, but also a fun experience. Just different than actually getting out there and cooking. Mm-hmm. Uh, surprisingly, a little more pressure in actually judging. Hmm. Uh, just from the standpoint of being coming from the sports world, yeah. and you know, a lot of those chefs not necessarily realizing how into food I am. Uh, how educated on food I am yep. and the palate that I actually have. <laughs> so I right, do not know, just some dude who you know, played football who's eating right, whatever. You know, yeah. some big guy who just loves to shovel food in his mouth. <laughs> right. You know, someone who's actually educated on food and, and loves to enjoy, you know, great food. Yeah. Uh, so it was a little more pressure that way. I wanted to make sure I um, articulated myself the right way so mm-hmm. it made sense to not necessarily just the chefs but also everyone watching yeah. you know you always want to be successful we're competitors that's what we do we want to be successful in what we do so of course it was a fun thing uh fun thing is we actually had to defend our title after i did the judging episode and that show will be coming up soon as well oh so you can't really reveal too much from that reveal, i can't reveal anything but it should be coming up soon all right well we'll be watching for that and i'll <laughs> make sure you text me when you know it's going to air gotcha. so we can tell our, our audience when to watch for that all right i introduced you as longtime nfl mm-hmm. running back fullback you played fullback for most of your career but i didn't say former mm-hmm. and i didn't say current and they say in the NFL, many players either don't retire, the NFL retires them as they <laughs> want to play. And, you know, the league is what the league is, right? The right. not for long mo- moniker. You last were with a team in, in 2017 with Seattle. And as we tape this in February of 2019, can you say you're officially retired? How does that work? Do you want to keep playing? You're 30 something years old. Do you want to keep playing? <laughs> you know, uh, I'm a proud 32. Am I? Am I? Proud I see 30. 33 in my, in okay, my research, proud 33. but you tell me. <laughs> Whatever it is, I'm proud to be it, you know. Uh, <laughs> That's right. You know, where I'm from, a lot of guys don't make it past 19. So it's true. I, I, understand. I, I live every year, you know, happy and proud to be that age. Yeah. Um, you know, as I grew older in the NFL, I never shied away from my age. I was proud to be it because I didn't – I don't feel an, a day over 24 years old. Mm. And uh, – that's the way I train. That's the way I live. And that's the, the amount of energy that I have. So, so I enjoy it. Um, but to answer your question, uh, you can say former. Okay. Uh, you know, after... Is that hard for you to say? I could it, sense it's it, even it, difficult it, for you to say. It is a little hard yeah. sometimes. Okay. Um, you know, after 10 years, it, I am, uh, I'm proud of, of everything that I've, I've been able to accomplish in this league mm. uh, from the way that I had to do it. Um, you know, there are very few regrets I have. Uh, you know, I, I, we wanted to go back. I, I still, you know, I still have a desire. I still have a fire for the game. Uh, I do love the game. Yeah. Uh, we had some chances to go back. The situation just wasn't right. Mm. And after 10 years of playing football and, um, having the, the hardships and trials that I had early on in my career. Yeah. I knew that the situation had to be right uh, because the way my family was growing and the way we were going about our life, I had to make sure it was just right. And I wasn't just going to say I played. I didn't want to play just to say, hey, I made 11 years or hey, I made 12 years or hey, I even made 13 years. You know that I didn't want 
to play just to have those notches on my belt. I didn't necessarily feel that it was worth it. I know it's hard for players in the league to to have that sort of abruptly stop for them. When you were let go by Seattle in 17, did you start to think maybe this is it? Or were you still believing that, you know what, I mean, I, I know I can do this. I just need the right guy to see me, the right team to see me, whatever that might be. Well, I absolutely knew I could do it. I, I mean, and I'll tell you this, you know, the hardest thing uh, is not necessarily being released or being cut. It's when it's not performance-based. Right. That's the hardest thing. And, and, yeah. and for me, you know, I've never been cut when someone's saying, you're just not good enough. Yeah. You know, that's the hard thing. It's the business it's, side. It's, it's either the business side. It's, it's always the business side. It's something, hey, yeah. you know, it, it's hard. It's hard. There's a lot of variables that play a part, and which most people on the outside looking in don't necessarily see. Uh, and a lot of it is just out of your control. You mentioned... You know, I mentioned your age. You're 33, according to our research. <laughs> I assume it's 33, Marcel. Uh, I'm going to believe you. You, you probably can, know better than it me. It says June 23rd, 1985. That so is you true. Tell me. I'm All 33, right. everyone. I'm 33. 33. <laughs> but you said you're just grateful to, to have made it past 18 based upon where you came from. Go back to where you came from and tell me why you say that and what life was like growing up. Well, for me, you know, um, born and raised in Inglewood, California, and... Uh, I love the city that I grew up in. You know it, it. So you're a Lakers fan, I presume. I'm not a Lakers fan. The form was right there, wasn't it? Man, we used to sneak into the form to go to games, <laughs> and I grew up a Boston Celtics fan. How? And I mean, I'm a Celtics fan too. So, so you know, go green. But how are you a Celtics fan from Inglewood, California? Paul Pierce grew up down the street from me. Yes, he did. That's right. You know, Inglewood legend, and we grew up saying he was Inglewood's finest. And as I was growing up, I was determined to take over the title of Inglewood's finest. Oh wow! And the truth was the truth. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So oh, yeah. it was always uh, that. That was that was our that, everyone. That's what we aspired to. You know, we sit in the front yard. We we run around and we, you know, I was a basketball guy growing up. I didn't play football. My twin brother and I we didn't play football until we were 16 years old, or juniors in high school. Wow. You know, and uh, that was only by chance. Right. Because my mom moved us out of the city abruptly. We found out, you know, three or four days before we were moving. So you were moving. Summer going into our junior year that we were moving 100 plus miles away from wow. everything that we knew. What was that like? Yeah. That was just crazy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were just finished summer school, just finished summer basketball. And we were, you know, we were kind of content with the thought that we would never play football. Yeah. And uh, we were just basketball guys, and we loved it. And uh, volleyball as well. I'll say volleyball guys, but don't tell anybody. I won't say anything. <laughs> so Your secret safe here. Know, so, so playing <laughs> basketball, my mom ends up moving us, you know, just to try and find us a better life. Yeah. You know, moved us up to um, Hesperia, California, something we had never heard of. We never imagined of being there. I've never heard of it. Where is that? It is um, probably 100 10 miles, uh, what do we say, east of Los Angeles. Okay. So it's right between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Okay. And yeah. that's where we moved. So so the idea of not making it to 18 when you said that earlier, was it because of the area that you were living oh, in before yeah. you moved? It, I mean, the statistics say, you know, when we were living, you know, in, you know, the 80s and 90s, you know, Los Angeles was, you know, the land of the gangbang. Yeah. And that's what it was all about. You know, it was right after the, the the crack cocaine epidemic, and it was all about, you know, gangbanging. Yeah. You know, it was either if you weren't rapping and you weren't playing ball, you weren't making it. Mm. And, you know, we always had a, a – my mother and my grandmother always took care of us. You yeah. know, they, they, were, they were great role models, and uh, they showed us what hard work meant. You know, um, my mom – you know, we had, you know, six boys. Wow. You know, two I had three boys in my house, and, man, we, I thought that was crazy. So it was crazy. Six but boys. But it was seven in the house. It was seven boys in the house, mm. and uh, it was crazy. It was always crazy. It was yeah. always hectic. It was always games. It was always events and everything. My mom worked her tail off all the time, and uh, she's the hardest-working person I know growing up. Yeah. 
That's where you got your work ethic, I would imagine. No, from. Absolutely. Yeah. No doubt. That's awesome. Uh, and at the same time, the way she worked, she never missed a game. Ever. Uh, all levels? All levels. Really? She never missed a game. Um, all the way until I got until, until I got to the league and, yeah. and moved away. But I mean, even college, like when I went off to school, she was she was at every first game and and home game and close away games that she could make. Hmm. And that's one thing that that uh, I always cherish from her. Yeah, Marcel Reese is our guest here on the podcast, four time Pro Bowler. But it wasn't always. I'm never going to say easy for you. <laughs> but when you make the Pro Bowl, that means you've gotten to a level that's pretty good. But in those nine seasons, and you bleed silver and black, right? You played nine seasons with the Raiders, but it wasn't something that was just given to you. You had to earn it. You had to, as I like to say, grind through. You were on the practice squad for the majority of your first couple seasons in the NFL. What was that like going through those first couple years? You weren't drafted, and who knew if you were even going to ever turn into a, a you know a player player at all. at all, much less a Pro Bowler. So take us through that. Well. You know, that's hard. I I've, I haven't had really much time to, and I've been out, you know, my first full year. Yeah. I, I've, I haven't had real, really taken the time to have reflection on my career yet. Mm. And I don't necessarily, you know, I'm kind of running from that time, if I can be honest with you. Why is uh, that? You know, because that, I always say that, uh, you know, I spend time with a lot of legends, especially um, the Raider legends. Yeah, you know that's that's one thing I always sunk sunk my heels in, my feet in when 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 I got there and and um, wanted to make sure I established myself because the history there was so great. Yeah, and the players there were so awesome. And when I got there, they were the most winning team in NFL history. Yeah. and you know I absolutely adore Al Davis. Um, you know, and owe him so much. You know, mm. so talking to those legends and, and watching them and we would, I mean, I would spend time with them everywhere, going to restaurants, you know, we traveled together, talking to them, soaking up all the history and watching them interact with people. And I would see them and they were, whenever they would sign, I would just sign my name. Whenever someone asked me, to R, I just sign my name and that was it. And uh, <laughs> whenever I would see them uh, give autographs, they would always write some accomplishment that they made, hmm. and if you if you if you watch a legend, it it would either be uh, you know Super Bowl twenty one or yeah. uh, Hall of Famer H O F yeah you know whatever that that big accomplishment accomplishment is, yeah. and uh, I always paid attention to that, and I asked one of them and. Uh, I'll keep them nameless because I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't. I didn't plan on telling this story at all. That's fine. And I'm, I'm not sure if he would clear that. No problem. <laughs> we'll say, we'll and, keep it nameless. And I asked him. I said, uh, "Why do you always sign that?" I said, I, "You know, why do you always sign?" He said, "Well, what do you sign?" I said, "I sign my name and my number." Yeah. And he said, "When you have time to reflect on your career." Mm. and you have something to be proud of and you want people to know that you're proud of that, you'll put it under your name. Wow. He said because sooner, powerful. He said because sooner or later, they'll stop calling you the matchup nightmare. <laughs> they'll stop calling you the best fullback in the game. And uh, they'll, stop, they'll, they'll stop calling you these nicknames that they have for you. Because he was hearing him yelling out and yelling out, and he says, "Who gave you that name?" And I start, "Well, John Gruden gave me that one, and this guy gave me that one. I don't know. You know, they just they just it just stuck." Yeah. And he says, "Sooner or later, they'll stop calling you those names, and when you reflect on your career and the things that you're proud of, you'll put it under your name." That's good. And you haven't even thought about that until right now. Four time Pro Bowler sounds pretty good. Four time Pro Bowler does <laughs> sound pretty good. <laughs> You can use that if you want. I'll give you permission, right? That's funny. Marcel Reese is our guest here on the podcast. Obviously, this is a faith in sports podcast. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked a ton of faith yet, so let's go there. Tell me about your walk with the Lord, where that started, how that took shape for you. Well, first, I'll stop you there and say we've talked a ton of faith already. It's true. It's true. You know, uh, we talk about me growing up, you know, only reason I made it past 19 was my faith. Mm. Um, when I tell you about my mother and my grandmother, 
man, that is completely, completely the foundation of my faith. You know, my, we grew up in the church, my grandmother, and um, we started going to, to now what is the largest church in Los Angeles on Crenshaw Boulevard, uh, West Angeles Church of God in Christ, uh, uh-huh. pastored by Bishop Blake, Charles E. Blake. And we went there every Sunday. And, you know, when my mom moved us away, we still drove an hour and a half on Sunday morning. Is that right? To get to church because that's all we knew. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes as kids, we were being drug, you know, to Sunday school. And it was, you know, little did we know it was a foundation that was being set into us, uh, you know, and our walk of faith. You know, when, your last question about my early years and it not being easy. You know, when I went undrafted, it was a complete surprise to me at the time. Mm. Like it is to a lot of guys. Sure. Um, you know, coming out of college, going to the University of Washington after junior college, you know, nothing ever came easy to me at that point. You know, I had to go to junior college route, um, and that was hard in itself. Um, got easy after junior college because, you know, I think everyone wants you, you know. Once you set records in junior college, when you feel like you could have been doing it all along. So I'll go to yeah. the University of Washington, and not necessarily easy there, but by my senior year, you know, uh, I end up, you know, leading the nation in yards per catch as a big wide receiver. Yeah. And, uh, you know, most people never realize that I played wide receiver my entire life until I got to the Raiders. Hmm. Um, but going undrafted was uh, – was definitely a hit to me. And, you know, I didn't know what to do but work. You know, but the first year I got to Oakland in 2008, my rookie year, you know, we go out there and we're playing and, you know, I'm just doing what I know. I feel like I'm balling. I'm making plays. And then, bam, no one prepares me for anything. But I go in there and they say, you know, we're going to put you on the practice squad, you know. I'm sitting here like, well, you guys changed my position. What's the practice squad like? Yeah. I don't know what to do. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what it means. I don't know how to take it. I don't know if I'm, hey, am I on the team? Am I in the league still? What am I doing? Technically, you're cut and then placed on the practice squad, right? Is that Which the proper word? That is. Yeah. That is. That's exactly correct. Which I knew nothing about. Yeah. Um, and I will tell you firsthand that it was one of the hardest things that uh, I had went through at the time. And most people will say it's first world problems, but I was going through it. Yeah. You know, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, It's your problem. You know what I mean? It's your situation you have to deal with. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we went through that year and and I got through it. But I didn't think there was going to be anything harder to go through in the league until they did it to me again the second year. Mm. And I knew I was ready. In my mind, I just knew I was ready. Um. I had some – I had two great men in my corner at the Raiders, um, one being the one person anyone wanted in their corner was Al Davis. Yeah. Um, but the second was – I mean, was a guy – was one of those legends. Hmm. And he was there. and, and The unnamed uh, legend that we won't talk about, right? Uh, Can you name him? No. Uh, okay. That's all right. It's okay. <laughs> well, no. This one I actually will name. Yeah. And, um, and his name is Willie Brown. Old Man Willie. Old Man Willie. Yeah. And uh, Old Man Willie loved me, and I didn't even realize he loved me. Mm. You know? And he took care of me, you know, with just his words and advice. Um. And it wasn't, let's see, how can I say it? It wasn't uh, faith-based advice, but sure. it led me to my faith. Hmm. Led me back to my faith. I think that's the best way I can say it. So that happened in the NFL? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. It happened in uh, 2009 when I was initially placed... Uh, back on the practice squad later on making it off of it but um, you know him 
and his advice helped me get through that year, which propelled me for the rest of my career. Yeah. Uh, and one, one scripture that actually changed my life and changed my career was uh, now my favorite scripture, which is uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 21 or so. And it's just putting on the whole armor of God. Yeah. And um, when I tell you that I needed protection from a lot of things, it, it protected me. And it, it led me to one of the routines that helped me get through the day-to-day life of the NFL. Mm. And uh, I would read it. I would, uh, <laughs> I would get to the facility extremely early. And I would read it and pray and try to protect myself the best way I could from all things evil that would transpire in that 12 hours of me being in that building. Wow. That's powerful. And that says, that says something about, about what God can do, right, in a person's life. And obviously after that time, your career starts to catapult and you go, for, like I said, four-time pro bowler in the league for a long time with Oakland uh, and I looked this up. You scored 15 career touchdowns. Okay, that so it? let's. Uh, that's still a lot. It's more 15 more than the people in this room have scored. <laughs> um, but uh, let's kind of pivot a little bit to to some more fun. So out of those 15, and it's still quite a bit, because you played fullback. <laughs> I mean, a lot of fullbacks aren't catching uh, passes and scoring touchdowns. You were you were a hybrid. We'll call it. Yeah. That's not fair to call you a fullback. Um, but what's your favorite story behind any of those touchdowns? So you scored 15. Maybe it's the first and one. It's only not fair to other fullbacks. That's fair. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you say, Marcel. No. no, listen. I had a lot of fun, man. And, but what's your favorite story? Do you have a story behind one of the ball? Maybe you kept the ball. Maybe maybe it was a fluke play. Oh, I kept a lot of balls. Yeah. No, no doubt about that. Okay. Um, but, jeez. Uh, well, you know what? I'll give you the story on my first one. Okay. Um, my very first touchdown in a regular season game, because I had some in preseason, my yeah. rookie year. But my very first touch in a, touchdown in a regular season game uh, was Brent's Cancer Awareness Week at mm. home in the Coliseum against the Houston Texans. And uh, I had blocked J.J. Watt a couple times by surprise. Caught him slipping, too, pretty good. And, uh, and that's one, you should put that, that underneath your autograph, just, by just the way. don't tell him I said I that. won't tell him, I promise. Um, but... <laughs> But we went into the red zone, uh, kind of low red zone. It was probably, you know, 12, 15 yards out or so. Yeah. And I went and bluffed him. We're going away from the black hole. So okay. I bluffed him. So we thought I was going to block him again. Went in, and I went out to the flat, um, caught the ball, ran into the end zone. And as I'm running to the end zone, don't slow down full speed ahead, I jump into the stands. So I'm going so fast that I didn't realize there were ladies. There were some females in the front row. Oh, no. So the females <laughs> and the men, everyone just scatter and part ways. And I end up in, like, the third row oh. of the stands. And I absolutely enjoyed every bit of it <laughs> because I've never looked back. And I was, you know, I just... Loves it. You know, every other time I jumped, they all caught me now. And, I'm, you know, all the fans enjoyed it because they knew it was coming because I did it every single time after that, and I loved it. But that was uh, my very first first touchdown in the NFL. We all got to YouTube that now and find that <laughs> touchdown because I, I can just envision a parting of the Red Sea and, and you go into like these stands. In the stands. And That's amazing. And feet just hanging still. But it was, it was absolutely fun. That's great. A couple more questions here with Marcel Reese. Looking back now. What would you tell your younger self? I always like this type of question, you know, and, and when you first came into the league, something that you wished you had known that now you know, you know, being in your wow. early mid-30s and uh, dad, a husband, uh, life's different than certainly what it was when you first <laughs> came into the NFL 10, 11 years ago. What would you tell your younger self? I would tell my, I would tell my younger self, just off the top of my head, I would tell my younger self to enjoy it. Hmm. Learn to savor it. You don't think you enjoyed it enough? No, yeah. not nearly. Um, man, you know, I, I, and that, you know, like I said, I've done everything in my career. I've, you know, everything except win a Super Bowl ring. You know, the four Pro Bowls, the All Pros, the, the touchdowns, yeah. everything. Um, 
threw a pass, completed a pass. You know, there's everything I've done except win a Super Bowl. But um, I don't think I necessarily enjoyed it enough. I didn't, you know, I didn't enjoy the cities enough. I didn't get out. I took everything extremely serious because I had to work so hard to get it yeah. that I didn't want to lose it. Mm. You know, when there was time to have fun and, um, you know, bring my wife and let her enjoy some things with me, I just took it too serious. Hmm. You know, there were times when we would have family days and I would tell my wife to, uh, you know, my fiance at the time or girlfriend at the time or, you know, early on wife at the time, I would tell her, you know, stay at home. And I was staying in my room and studying and not saying that me being dedicated wasn't good or great. I know what you mean. Yeah. But I could have enjoyed it more and made that time with her because yeah. she deserved it as well. Mm-hmm. And, and now you get uh, to make up for lost time, right? <laughs> I can try to make up for lost time. And, and, um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's just been one of, one of my struggles now that I feel slightly ashamed of, in a way, to my wife. You know, obviously, a lot of that paid off by, you know, in most of the time being the smartest guy in the room and, you know, being the most, you know... Prepared. Prepared in the room. Yeah. Never was caught off guard in a game uh, and, and doing things like that. But at the same time... You know, those things don't put a smile on my wife's face. I was very consumed by the game. And my consumption of the game sometimes got in the way of my walk with Christ. Hmm. And those are those are those are the times that, you know, I wish I had the wisdom to understand what was going on when it was going on. Last question here. Uh, thank you for doing this. This has been fantastic. What Cut is me short here? Huh? Cut me short here. No, we're over 30, almost 30 <laughs> minutes. How long you want to go? You, you got more stories? Share it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Marcel Reese making me feel bad here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. No, what, what, is, what is God teaching you right now? That's a question we ask all of our guests on the podcast. But for you in the past year, we can just go back to like a year ago at this point and where you were then, where you are now. What's the greatest lesson that the Lord has taught you in this season of life where he has you right now? He's teaching me so many lessons right now, mostly about myself, if I'm being honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's teaching me about me. He's teaching me about being about my uh, deficiencies in life right now. Mm-hmm. Um, he's teaching me about some, uh, some uncertainties that, that I may have. Um, some fears I may have, and uh, also some attributes that I didn't know I had. You know, he's teaching me about uh, leadership outside of football. You know, I spent so much time uh, working myself to to um, be a be a leader of men on the field and off the field, but always surrounded by football. Mm-hmm. So now he's uh, he's teaching me that. Uh, that I have that ability in life in general as well. And yeah. it doesn't have to just do with my brothers and my family and leading that, but outside of that. Um, and, it's, you know, it's a beautiful thing. You know, I, I've, been, I've been really enjoying uh, the process, to say, um, because I get to spend a lot of time with, with my son and my daughter and, and, mm-hmm. and my wife as well. But it's, it's been fun uh, doing, you know, school drop-offs and, and you know, taking them to practices and they're only four, you know five and three right now but still a great time and to be a dad isn't it <laughs> it's just it's just awesome and yeah. I'm looking forward to the to the years to come but you know I um I was I was I was talking to I was talking to a woman uh not too long ago and you know the story that the, the a topic of faith came up. How much football players and athletes don't do in the church and, hmm. you know, how she felt and uh, how she felt and, and a lot of people feel and, and even my wife has had some of these concerns about athletes and, and their faith that a lot of it is not genuine that they see on TV. Hmm. A guy scores a touchdown and takes a knee or 
points up to the sky or makes a three-pointer, points up to the sky, or hits a home run and points up to the sky. Oh, you know. Yeah. And I told her this. Uh, I said, you can't always judge what you see because what you see is limited. Yeah. But what I realized as I went on with my career that I don't glorify God to play football, but I play football to glorify God. Yeah. And that's what I would have to say to my, not only my younger self, but any other younger athletes out there to keep at the forefront of their mind because sometimes, like when I got consumed with playing football, instead mm. of letting football be the one A part of my life, yeah, I was that 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 phrase can get easily reversed. But I think the main thing is that we continue to remind ourselves every single day, every morning before we get out of that car to, to enter that building that we play the game in order to glorify him. And it's not the other way around. Yeah. Because that's the talent and gift that he's given us. They say at this conference that we're sitting at that you're not a football player who happens to be a Christian. You're a Christian having an athletic experience. Absolutely. It's good stuff. Marcel Reese, this is awesome. I didn't want to, you know, spend two hours here because we want to have you back and be able to talk some more, right? Uh, this is awesome. Thank you for joining us here on the podcast. We've been waiting for this for a while. I'm glad we were able to do it in person. And uh, I wish you nothing but the best in the future. And we'll, we'll definitely get you back on. Thanks for having me, Jay. I appreciate it. Thanks, man.